SAS, which are syntactically awesome style sheets. SAS is a CSS preprocessor. The project is about nine years old. It's a little rough when it first started, but it's, uh, it's pretty solid these days. It essentially allows you to add into the process of creating CSS some basic programmatic stuff, variables, conditional statements, functions, mixins, basic arithmetic, nesting, things like that. Files are written in the SCSS syntax, which we'll go over. That's a CSS3 extension, and you compile it through the SAS compiler, which creates perfectly valid CSS3 markup ready to go to the browser. Along with a few libraries, there's a Bootstrap SAS library that you can use that brings Bootstrap into it. There's a couple of others like Compass and Bourbon, which give you basically libraries of mixins that you can use when you're creating your stuff. This becomes a very, very fast way to develop CSS and more importantly, a very, very fast way to modify CSS. The concept you have to get used to before you start working with a, a CSS framework is you're going to start moving away from presentational markup and moving towards semantic markup. So this is an example of presentational markup. This should look familiar to everybody who's a dev. You have a lot of classes in there that are defining things like how wide stuff is, how tall stuff is, what color stuff is. Um, when you create presentational markup, what you're essentially doing is hard coding directly into your source what it's supposed to look like. So you're bringing that a step away from your CSS. Where this starts to cause a problem is when you want to make your site skinnable. It also means that if I want to change something, I'm going to have to go in and edit the original source code, which is always a problem because now it's got to go through an extra layer of QA. It's got to go through an extra layer of validation. It's got to go through an extra layer of everything because you're not just modifying the CSS. You're also modifying your HTML source. So semantic markup looks more like this. It is both much, much easier to actually follow what the heck is going on because everything is named by what it is and what it does rather than by what it looks like. So as you transition into the wider world of using a CSS preprocessor, this becomes a very, very important thing to get used to. And it takes a little getting used to. People are used to thinking of HTML as a visual medium, and this separates the content of your HTML from the appearance of your HTML. So the, the first and most wonderful thing, and I'm sure everybody who has ever used CSS has asked themselves, why can't I make that a variable? And the answer is because CSS is not a programming language, but through SAS, it gives us the ability to define variables, as you can see here, and then utilize them within our project. And once this runs through the SAS compiler, it's going to come out looking exactly as it does on the right. It's going to replace the font, the base font size margin. You can also perform calculations on those variables. So I can have my font size be one and a half times larger and my margin be 1.25 times larger. And when it compiles, it'll give me 24 pixels and 0.625 M's instead of 16 and 0.5. But you have to be careful, you cannot mix units. So you can't multiply pixels and M's, you can't subtract pixels from M's. It has to still be able to compile to standard CSS. Nesting is one of the best things and one of the absolute most dangerous things about SAS. Where you run into the problem is it's really, really easy to go absolutely nest crazy. So we'll, we'll get to some of the warnings in a second. Nesting allows us to basically place another selector inside a selector. When this uh, renders out, what it's going to give us is the P, which is going to contain width 100, uh, you can nest properties. So all of the font properties, the background properties can be joined together. So you can do font weight and family, which will compile to font weight and font family. It's more of an organizational thing. Uh, when it gets to your anchor tag, it's going to give you paragraph anchor because anchor is underneath paragraph. And then to nest on the same level, you use the ampersand. So paragraph anchor hover. You get the green color. Now, as I said before, it is really easy to go nesting happy. This is the first thing that everybody who uses SAS does. So uh, starting now, just start avoiding the problem before it starts. You do not want to use nesting for organization. That's not what nesting is for. Nesting is for 
creating things that are dependent on a parent. Every time you nest a level, you're adding specificity. The more deeply you nest, you start to just defeat the whole purpose of CSS. The purpose of CSS is to create a small number of simple rules that produce a complex and robust output. The more specific you become, the more you are hard coding little bits and pieces rather than relying on those general rules. And it starts causing, you know, weird problems and conflicts all the way down the line. So don't nest if it's not necessary. Uh, ask yourself, do I have to nest? Is this an important thing to have nested? Is it essential? Is it going to work if I don't nest it? And if it's going to work if you don't nest it, don't nest it. There's a, an article I'll actually link to at the end of this the article is about you following the inception rule, which is never go more than four levels deep in your CSS if you can possibly avoid it. And it is occasionally necessary to go a fifth level, but uh, very, very rarely. So here's an example of why you don't want to over nest. So this is a uh, div container nested inside body, div content nested inside container, div articles nested inside content, and then you've got div post, div title, div content, paragraphs. When this compiles, it's going to look like that. And nobody in their right mind would ever write CSS that looks like this because that is a specificity nightmare. And when you start using nesting in SAS to create your organization rather than using it to create actual dependencies, your code starts to look like this. And when you find a problem, good luck untwisting that. So the next thing you have are basic control directives. So uh, most important one always being if, else, if, and else. So if type is foo, you'll get blue. If type is bar, you'll get red. In all other situations, you'll get black. It's just like a normal if then else statement. So this will, of course, compile to paragraph color blue. The next one is the for loop. I can, uh, I can access a for loop. You instantiate a variable. You give it what the range is going to be. You can call the variable. If you want to call the variable in text, you use that uh, pound and then curly braces um, format. And you can, of course, do math with it as well. So this would output as bar 1, bar 2, and bar 3 at 2M, 4M, and 6M. You can generate functions. So if you need to be able to do math in the process and you want to function, make it into a function that's more complicated, um, like this is one to do a basic whole number powers. Um, and this is used, uh, in this case, to create a font size that is 25% larger. Uh, scaled three times and then you multiply by 1m to give it the m extension and this would be 1.95312 m's. Mixins are sort of like functions uh, except for they actually put output into your uh, your source code. So an example of a mixin would be the header mixin which sets the font weight, font family, color, and margin of anywhere you include it. So if you include it into header one and you could have more CSS inside header one as well, it'll take that stuff and fill it into your header one. Uh, so you can call common repeatable things. Uh, you can also add parameters to mix in so that you can have uh, variables and you can utilize those in as well. The next thing you can do is extend other selectors and what extension does is take, in this case, bar and add it to foo. So you get foo and bar both become the first one and bar becomes the second one. Extend only selectors allow you to go one step further than this. You can actually create a selector that will only exist if it has been extended. So in this case, instead of using a dot for the foo class, we're going to use a percentage sign. So Percentage side foo will never actually exist in our output. It will only exist when you extend it. So it will have bar and faz and baz will all be picked up. It'll propagate. So when baz extends bar, it will also extend foo because bar extends foo. So it does follow. And then here's some resources that you guys can use. The actual SAS language site, the SAS documentation, um, and then the SAS Playground at SAS Meister, which we're going to use in a second for our light coding. And uh, the SASWay.com, uh, which is the Inception Rule article I mentioned earlier.